Hey guys, thanks for clicking on this one. You guys really responded well to my uh, right here, right now series that I started for freshwater stripers and salt water, but I'm doing a lot of freshwater right now. And the series is designed so when it pops up in your feed, and you, if you subscribe, as soon as it pops up, that's where you need to fish, and that's the time you need to fish. So I'm going to show you where and when. Uh, so you can take all the guesswork out. A lot of times when these videos are posted, they were shot you know a month or two in advance, so it's kind of a hard to follow along so using some footage I already shot coupled with some new stuff I'm gonna try to cover as many lakes as possible and as many situations as possible so right now it's summer and basically what you need to do is you need to, to uh, figure out which kind of lake you have uh, most striper lakes especially in the south but pretty much anywhere they stock saltwater stripers and some hybrids uh, you're gonna have one of two different types of lakes for the most part there are a few outliers but there are two main types that are the most common you're going to have one like this this is bugs island car lake k-e-r-r -R. but don't get hung up on the names of these too much because what's good here is good on 50 lakes in the south i'm not kidding that's how we did the nsba fishing so many different lakes once you learn uh if you have this style lake or this style you can pretty much put them to any lake so this style here uh, it's very common, probably the most common. It's just a regular, you know, river system that was flooded, okay? And at the very top of the lake, or the water that feeds, is just a shallow river. This is uh, close to the upper end of Bugs Island. And it's just a shallow little river that trickles in. That's one type. The other type is a type like this on Gaston, where, again, it was a, a river system that was flooded to make a lake. And as you go up, you see the, the river system starts the river system starts below a much deeper lake. So this is a Carr Lake above Gaston. And where the water flows from Carr to Gaston, it's about 80 feet or more below the surface. So when this water comes out down here, it's cold. So this, this is a, down here, the, the water comes out 80 foot or more below the surface of Carr. So it's very, very cold. So these two lakes, are very different and I'm going to show you right now for this time of year uh, how to attack a lake with a dam above it and cold water in the river system and without it. What we like about these types of lakes is we know that very cold water is up here so in the summertime it's kind of a no-brainer. The only problem is when water comes out below these very deep lakes above there's very little dissolved oxygen as it goes through. So some lakes put aerators in the dam or they'll aerate the, the uh, water above it to try to help that so at least the water uh, doesn't come down with very little dissolved oxygen and it can trap a lot of fish and you know they come up here because it's nice and cold then they get trapped in areas where there's not enough oxygen and they die so that's why they put these aerators in here to keep this water good and, and fertile i do appreciate the support guys i really like that you love the right here right now series and we're going to get onto it right now and we're going to cover a lake with a dam above it feeding nice cold water everything you need to know soup to nuts fishing line to fishing net, what kind of crackers you should bring on the boat, and everything. It's all here. Keep your support, guys. Love you. Mean it. All right, guys, I'm getting ready to do a video. I wanted to show everything we do from start to finish, how we get bait, how we prepare, and everything else. This is a lake, uh, southern eastern lake. This is Lake Gaston. Not really known for great striper fishing right now. Back in the 80s, it was a pretty incredible lake. And there are still some big fish up in the river systems and stuff up in here, but Overall, it's not a great striped lake. You can get some good numbers sometimes, but a lot of these fish are in the 12 to 14, 16 inch range. So uh, I thought it was a good lake to do it. I haven't fished this lake for striped bass in a lot, a lot of years. Only time I'm really fishing here is catfish, and even that's not very much. But I figure let's do it all. Let's start from the beginning. There's several ways to get bait on this lake. This lake is a little trickier to get bait during the day. So say on Car Lake or any of these lakes in the south, you can go in the back of a creek usually, and you'll see the you know, the gizzard shad popping and flipping, you can throw your net and get some. It's trickier here, this is more of a river type lake, not a whole lot of creeks. There's some on the lower end, but it can be tricky to get bait during the day. So I'm going to show you a few ways how we do it. And uh, we'll take you through the day and see what we catch. All right, real quick, let's look at our rigs, our rods here. We're going to have eight of these rods. I only have four here now, but 
we got rigging four more up so here we go these are going to be for our planers and our floats that's all we're going to be pulling because we're going to be in a river system that is shallow less than 18 feet of water but as shallow as 10 foot uh, smaller baits this is that owner hook that mutu mutu owner circle i love the straight shank on this but no bent eye straight eye it's a two watt 15 pound test floor a liter you can use mono if you like one to two glass beads and our main line here is 30. the reason it's 30 is because we use these for everything i use them for cut bait and salt water we'll catch 50 pound fish on eels in salt water with these and i'll catch three pound stripers on down lines in georgia so you know it's we get it all done with 30 pound if we need to change our leaders, which we constantly do, that's what we do. We're gonna be using planer boards and floats. I like these boards, they're not huge, they're not super heavy yet, you can still pull some decent sized baits with them. Zach Royce, these are the Zach Royce boards. Good friend of mine, great kid. And we're gonna use Ready Rig TOS planer floats and the straight floats. So we're going to have a couple of those out there, ready rigs and the regular ready rig as well. So the idea is, you know, our planer boards are going to be out here to the side of the boat. And coming back, we have our ready rig planer float right there, kind of off in the corner. We'll have two of those, and then we'll have one straight one right in the middle in the back. And that's good, it just keeps our lines nice and separate. And uh, really nice. They, it's a nice little spread. It's a shallow river, not a lot of room for a lot of boats. We may only be able to put one or two boards on each side, probably at least two on each side. And if we can add more, we do. I usually don't do down lines because it's only you know, 10, 12 feet of water on the side of the boat sometimes. We want the boards up on the bank. That's where those striped bass are. Once we get ready to set out our boards and floats, we have to use our trolling motor to pull us along. I use the Motor Guide XI-5, fantastic trolling motor, compass steer in it, and it's reliable incredibly reliable and never have to worry about it. that's why I love it if you have a Minn Kota, that'll work too and what we do is use our remote here and I'll deploy that trolling motor deploy the trolling motor and then we'll pull the boat around anywhere from two tenths of a mile an hour up to you know 1.5 miles an hour depending on current wind and what's happening up there so just set the compass steer to hold us on a heading we let our boards out try to keep our baits close to the bank if we can and get a good spread in summertime about an hour before dark these fish will be up on the surface sucking off the top pretty easy to find if it's glassy out you'll just see them little tiny mouths just sucking on the top eating up stuff off the top a lot of times these are small baits, but sometimes they're decent. In this particular lake, sometimes we can get, you know, five, six inch baits behaving like yearlings on top. Usually it's the yearlings that are on top. But uh, we're gonna see if we can get some decent ones by doing that. So we're just looking for them sucking on top. We're gonna throw the net on pretty easy. Three eighths mesh net, pretty small. Let's see what we can get. Stop right here. You see them right there? All right, circle around, John, and come back right in with the window or back. We got a pretty big group right here. You can even hear them feeding. Let's sink some of those big ones at the bottom. All right, these are yearlings. Way too small. Real quick, just pick the big ones. Man, none of these are really big, huh? Not really. There are a few that look decent. Some thread fins and some gizzards in here. This is a Christmas tree. I don't like Christmas trees. All right, I don't do a whole lot with our bait. This water temperature is 85 degrees, so we were gonna put some ice on here for, for tonight. Now, these aren't terribly big baits, a lot smaller than I'd like, of course, but we're still gonna take care of them, right? So uh, what we're gonna do is, I just add salt and ice. You can see what's missing out of this tub. 
that's what I dumped in here. Uh, probably add a little more. If these are bigger baits, I put put a little bit more. About two solo cups. Uh, I do about two solo cups per 25 gallons. So maybe for 20 gallons. So anywhere from four to six solo cups of ice I would dump in here. This is just regular pool salt. And we are gonna ice this thing down. So I wanna get it from 85 to 75. So nice and gentle. This is well water salt. I'm sorry. This is well water ice. I know some people are worried about having chlorine in their ice, but I, I've used ice that I bought at gas stations for years and years and years, and I've never really had a problem with chlorine in it, so I don't know. You read the bag, it doesn't say if there's chlorine in it, but if you know if there's chlorine in there, put it in the comments for me, but I've really had nothing but good luck. So we don't need to get this down to the 50s or anything, but if we can get it from 85 to 75, rates go up. I mean, this bait will be nice and frisky. It'll look just as good as the day we caught it. We're going to use this all weekend. Okay, that's how you net bait for yearlings on the surface. A few hours, we're going to go to the lights here. When the bait are up under the lights, I'll show you how we get bait there. This fish jumping. Oh, yeah. There's a uh, shad popping everywhere in here already. All right, guys. This is our second method of getting bait. Earlier, uh, right before dark, we came out and threw on some yearlings. Mostly gizzard shad with some thread fins mixed in and uh, those are very easy pickings, but not very big The, the fish on this lake aren't giant uh, The average, you know might be seven or eight pounds. Sometimes you can get on some good ones I have some buddies who caught a few over 20 this year up by the dams, but I can't get my boat all the way up in there but My point is we don't need gigantic bait uh, You know here, you know, six, seven inch bait would be perfect. We're probably gonna end up with some fives, maybe six inch baits. We have three inch baits in there right now, which, you know, I'm not too proud to put a three inch bait on a hook if that's all we got, but I think we can improve on that. So if you're going to a lake you've never been to, or you don't know where to get started, find a bridge. Bridge with lights on it. If you have a spotlight or a, you know, a street light near a bridge, great place to get started. Chances are if you hit a few bridges at night, especially if the lights on them, you're, you're gonna get some kind of good bait. So this is just a bridge back here in the back of this creek. It's a concrete bridge and there's a spotlight above it. I'm sorry, there's a street light above it. And we had a half moon today, but the moon has been gone for about four hours or so. So hopefully the bait is underneath this light. If you have a full moon, it can be really tough because the light is everywhere and the bait isn't attracted to that street light. All right, we just netted some herring here by the bridge, some thread fins and some herring. The surface temperature is 85 degrees. We netted these yearlings last night as backups, small baits. We threw a bunch of ice in here and got it down to 75. And it's probably crept up a little bit, but not much. So we're gonna throw some more ice in here. And the salt I put in earlier is probably enough. Everyone uh, likes to kind of figure out how much ice and ask me how much ice and what temperature do you need. Anything cooler than what you're starting with is good. 
I don't think I need to get 85 degree baits down to 50 degrees or anything like that. And even if you did, you'd shock the baits once they get used to that. You hook them and throw them in the warm water. So if it's 85, if I can get down to 75, that's great. If I'm gonna keep these for like two or three days or something like that, I'd get it a bit cooler and do a couple of water changes. But I won't change this water in a 12 hour period. And I'll just keep it cool. You know, if I uh, feel that it's getting a little warm or, you know, I just kind of have that sense that it's warm and needs more, I'll just dump more ice as the day goes on. I do keep a cheap thermometer in here. The surface was 75 when I started. Right now, it's right at 70, which is excellent. So if it was 85 to start with, got it down to 75, and now we're, we're that low. That's pretty good. Matter of fact, I probably don't need any more ice. I'll throw one more, one more bucket full to get a little bit low and I probably won't have to worry about it the rest of the day. All right, so you got your uh, radar on? Yes, sir. All right, so let's, let's work on our night vision. So let's start turning off the lights in the boat. Shot on top. Sure, you see that? Yeah. Look at that. I flipped that light on and all this bait started popping. Huh. Look at how big it is. Wow. Oh. Ooh, that was a good size shad up there. I think these are just popped. I just saw this dock over here, lots of bait in the area. It's about 18, 19 feet deep, which for this lake, is quite deep. Light on me up there, John. That's a small net. I'll you know, probably get the big one out just for a little chuck. I'm going to go ahead and throw it the straight pursuit method. Goodness, this is what we needed. Look at the size of those herring. Woohoo! Open that lid. All right. That is a whole nother ball game right there. Look up. Look at a little net, too. I'm going to throw the big net once on this. Step back. I know. You guys. We used to use a giant skipjack and trout for bait and all that big stuff, and I've done it all too, but you guys are used to that. I'm laughing at this, but in this situation, that's primo bait. It's because it's 16 foot deep at the end of that dock right there. The water's cooler up here. The guy's got just enough light on his uh, boat sitting there. Bring them in. Getting old. Look at that herring right there. Come over here. They 
this here, we're going to go in the mouth and out the top. It's a small hook because these baits are small. The fish are kind of small. So. Alright guys, the fish hits and starts screaming, just pick it up and crank. Don't yank, but get to it quick. I don't want to see any of this. No, I got the last one you get this and none of it. Grab the rod. Okay. While you're doing that, it's gone. It's off. Now if I just yell, before you get to it, if I say crank, it just means crank with it in the rod holder. I might just say crank, crank, crank. There's some really sweet herring in here. I have I haven't netted net this many good sized herring like this in this lake in a long time. <laughs> Alright, coming through. Can't wait. Okay, get this in the water quick. Again, in the mouth at the top. And uh, the reason I do that is because I have found that they get less foul hook that way. Because if you go through the nostrils, I would have to use one of those little bait buttons. Get you sliding up the line and rehooking the hook point back into the bait's head. And the strike. On the floats, I tend to let a lot more line out behind them. We're not going to run over a jug line, are we, John? Yes, sir. Alright, these are the TOS floats. Just put them on the line. There is one to our right now. And I grab the line coming from the rod tip. I put a little twist in it. And I grab the loop of the twist. I don't grab it like this. I grab it so the loop is in the release. When the fish pulls, it just pulls that little twist out. The float pops off every time. So you don't have to worry about the float getting stuck. Especially on a smaller fish. Alright, John, pay that one out. Okay. Okay. I think we're okay. Mix it up. Don't be afraid to mix it up. Especially when you're getting started for the day. Look at the fish finder right there. Screen on the right. I vary the, the distance behind the boards. This one right here, I don't know, I'm about 10 foot behind the board. This river is shallow. It's only uh, 18 feet where we are right now. 13 feet where we are right now. So sometimes I'll just do a couple feet behind the board, just two or three. When the bass or stripers are hungry, they'll, they're attracted to the board sometimes. Not all the time, but when they're aggressive, anything on the surface. I just came across some nice marks there. Catfish, small stripers. You can see the shape of the fish on that one. Grab him. Nice little striper. Good job, bud. Good job. Hold on. Don't rip the water. Don't rip the water. All right, now lift him in quick. Step back, guys. Step back, guys. Good job, bud. The way Lake Gaston has it, uh, Carr is the same. A lot of these lakes, 
In the summertime, they want you to keep your first four fish per person because if you let them go in the summertime, there's a good chance they're going to die. It doesn't mean they're going to die, but there's a good chance you let them back into 85 degree water, they'll die. Uh, I still do catch and release, but I will, won't go past my creel limit, even though I didn't catch anything. So we have, say I'm fishing by myself, I, I catch and release four fish, I'm done for the day. Even though I let them go, I'm going to count that because they may die. So, uh, you know, you don't have to, you can go catch and release and catch 100 if you really want to. Uh, but I choose not to and yeah, you know summertime lice fish die the best thing to do is move on to a different species or a, You know call it an early day, but this one's hooked in the, in the gut. We pulled the stomach out So we're gonna go ahead and make fish tacos out of this guy Good job Ty Good job, buddy Yeah, you gotta tighten it a touch more, nothing's coming in. Okay, tighten it a little bit. There you go. Here recording. What a pool noodle. Kyle, you're going to need the pump to get that fish in. So you get the crank down, crank, and now pull up. Stop cranking, pull up, and then crank down. Just do a little smoother. Attaboy. Put the rod on your other, on your other arm. There you go. That's it. That's it. Pump and take. Pump and take. Try to put them right here on this side for you. Ooh, that's a nice one. That's a good striper, man. Get yeah. the rod out some. Out. That's a crank, crank, crank. That's a really good striper for this lake. Not huge, but I tell you what, for here, that's a solid fish, buddy. Good job, man. So you can see that little, that little circle hook, man, that little owner. You do. I like that straight eye on these. So that was on a big herring. One was a nice big herring. Not huge fish in here, but for this lake, that's a good quality fish. All right, Ty, take a picture. Take a picture and we'll let him go real quick. All right, we're in the river here. You can see it's not very big. And it's just at the top of one of these lakes. But you can see these are fish hanging off the bottom. There's no current right now, so they can pretty much swim everywhere in the water column. A good mark there. There's a really nice mark just a few minutes ago. That was directly under the boat. So that's why we're doing boards up here, because <laughs> with our boards and floats, we can fish shallow. We can fish two feet of water, you know. We can spread them out, put just a few feet behind the baits. I mean put the baits a few feet behind the boards of your floats. We have no weight at all on any of these. Just a plastic bead, I mean a glass bead, maybe a couple glass beads on some of them to get that little rattle sound. But in summertime, you know, a lot of the southern lakes you would be, if you weren't in a river, you'd be chasing deeper fish and fishing down lines straight down or, you know, troll the artificials deeper or jig on them. But if you have a lake that has a river system like this that you can get up behind a higher lake that's letting cold water out it's a really good place to start in the summertime so right now this water is coming out below car lake so car lake is way up there uh, 100 feet or so so all this water comes out of car lake 80 90 feet down something like that I don't, i'm not sure exactly but all that water is very cold the only problem is there's not oxygen there's no oxygen in that no dissolved oxygen so fish come up looking for the cold water because the lake is in the upper 80s but 
they can get trapped in areas that, do, that, that does not have enough oxygen for them. So we're trying to f find that happy medium, you know, that cooler water that they're happy in, but also have uh, enough oxygen for them in the bait. You saw bait popping up this whole way, so if there's bait popping up in here, it's probably uh, comfortable for the striped bass. Give it a second, and then we'll check it. Three good marks right there. Yeah, when the current's running really strong, these fish will be all the way down in the bottom, but with no current, they can go anywhere they want. Woo, fish on, keep cranking. Nice, John. Reel this front one in. Catch that fish, Troy. Catch that fish, Troy. Rod up high. There you go, Troy. Kyle, keep Tyler, keep doing what you're doing. That a boy. Striper, Troy. Is this your first striper? Yep. <laughs> Tyler, run to the front with that board. Run to the bow, buddy. I'm no professional. All right, these are two of the baits that we caught. This is a gizzard shad here. This is a thread fin. The herring were much larger. You saw those earlier. You'll see they both have that little thread fin on the dorsal, so that's not the way to tell them. If you look at the mouth, see how blunt that top nose is? And this mouth here is a little closer to the mouth of a herring. Also, the yellow tail, this little bit of purple that you kind of see through there, and the dot is not nearly as pronounced usually. And when it is, it's it's closer to the gill plate and up high, where this is a little further away from the gill and it's, it's a little darker. But you can see that yellow fin in the mouth, like a herring, big difference. That's really the best way to tell. All right, I'm gonna take a minute and show you our rig here. This is a two-aught owner hook. This is a circle. I like the ones with the straight eye. MUTU is the model number. The demon circles are nice. Owner, really good hooks. I really like them. That straight eye is important. All right, we have three, four feet. This is fluorocarbon. It's 15 pound test. This water is not terribly clear. You don't need fluorocarbon in water like this necessarily, but I like to go ahead and use it on everything. You never know, right? Now, my main line is 30 pound test. That's because we use these rods and reels for everything. So we'll troll with them, we'll use cut bait, we'll fish in salt water where there's fish this big, and we'll use them in lakes where there's fish this big. Basically, we change our leader depending on the fish we're, we're going for. So if you're using small baits, we'll go with lighter line if we can get away with it. If we're in cover or tight to, you know, structure, we have to go a little heavier. But here, there wasn't much structure. Rocked in some area, but these fish are pretty much coming to the top when they're, when they're hooked up. And there's nothing really solid on the bottom except for a few little areas. So we only went with 15 pound test. If you go with 15 pound test, it's nice and light. The baits look much more natural. Smaller diameter, a little less apt to scare the fish away. So 15 pound test was, was good for this. It's really good for freshwater stuff. A lot of freshwater stuff. Like I said, unless you're on the bottom over structure, 15, 12 pound test is nice. This is our, our 30 pound main line. You'll see a glass bead. These baits were small. So I only had one to one glass bead. If we have big baits where they can really pull and really put some action on the line, I like to go with two or three glass beads because they'll rattle and knock together. Plus the bead is good because when you're using your board or your float, when you trigger the board, it slides down and stops here. It doesn't go over your swivel and go all the way down to your fish. And it's also really nice when you're pulling boards, anything really, to have a lighter leader than your main line because if you snag up you'll break your leader and you won't break your main line and your board won't float away on you so these are our reels these are the accurate 400s for fresh water especially for small fish like this these are way overkill of course like i said we use these for everything but an abu 6500 uh, or the accurate fury is a great fresh water reel <coughs> great for salt water too but. and we just had our floats and boards and Hope this video helps a few of you out. Please subscribe. I'll be your best friend. Be safe on the water. Leave a few for me. Go fishing, man. It's a nice day.
you got. Choose that piano wire. Tell me my business again. <laughs>